It's 11 now. Today we are going to start our lecture on PTE, partial uh, differential equation. <coughs> Everyone here except Ami. Oh, Ami? No, that's not Ami. Okay, let me check. Alright, we just talked that Fortran typically is faster than like G Fortran. Full optimization take 0.7. NumPy is like 4.2. Okay. Six times slower than Fortran for the runtime. So Intel Fortran maybe 12 times faster with just NumPy. MATLAB kind of slower. This is to solve 2D Laplace equation. Okay. So Python is five second. <laughs> Never run. If you don't use NumPy, it will be very slow. So the question is, using Python is really better? It's better for prototyping the code. Okay. When you write the code first time, to make to minimize your development time, you write it in, in Python first to prototype your program. And once you know that the code is run, you can improve the performance by either link Fortran, uh, link Python with Fortran, use Fortran library. It will be not that fast, but it's totally is faster. I mean, faster development, and you get okay performance. The reason that NumPy is fast because it uses Fortran library. Okay? So Fortran can be linked with or C can be linked with Python. That's just to let you know. So, so for PDE, here's PDE, okay, which language that we are going to use to solve. You will learn it in Python just to know how to do it. Okay? So PDE with Python. Mm. Let's start. So, what well, you already have the homework on ODE, you will finish your ODE, and then you should be able to do homework already. Homework is short, but it requires you to understand the material first. Still next. Wednesday and next Wednesday you will get a project. Okay, your project will be about doing something like this. So wait, by next Wednesday you mean not next Wednesday but the following one, right? Wednesday after the Thanksgiving, you you will do something like this. What's that about? That is the answer when you solve partial differential equation. Let's take a look at it. Okay, we will talk about finite difference to a certain depth. Not fully cover. There's a lot more out there. We don't talk anything about finite volume. Okay, and we talk a little bit about finite element. Okay, finite difference work same way that you get for finite volume, except for the case where your shape is not square. So if your grid is triangle or your grid is some other shape, finite difference have a hard time of doing it. First thing we will do, partial derivative approximation. Talk about type of PDE. And I think today we can do just one D heat equation. Okay. So that is for today. So the next homework uh, hmm? similar to this one, like a tutorial? The project? No, the homework next the one. Homework ODE, ODE, ODE one? Yeah. No better 3C for third order. Okay, so it has a tutorial or just? Just a homework. Okay. The tutorial, please consider the iPython notebook as a tutorial. Yeah. In the, okay, let's, I'm sorry, but let's talk about homework a little bit. For the homework, during the class, we talk about Lobetta 3C, fourth order. But the homework is just third order. It's easier. 
However, it is unseen because you cannot use my code to do it, and there's no there's no like available SciPy function for that label or something. So we need to code it. And you can use my code. My code is for fourth order, right? And you can adjust a little bit, and then it will become third order. Change the coefficient. It's fun. I like it. Okay. PDE. First thing, we should be able to approximate value of partial derivative. So if I have f as a function of x, y, and z, d by dz, partial derivative d by dz can be approximated by f and x, y, and z plus epsilon. You just plus epsilon point z minus the starting point f, x, y, z divided by epsilon. So this kind of thing is we call forward finite difference. Okay, look at the formula for forward finite difference. First order accuracy. First derivative, first order derivative, uh, first, uh, first order accuracy, we use point zero and point one. Okay. Point zero means this point. That is a point zero, current point. Point one means next point at z plus epsilon. That's the next point. And this table, that is the coefficient. Okay. The number that you see in this thing is the coefficient. So this means we put minus 1 for the point 0. So that is a minus 1. We put plus 1 on the next pi. So that is like plus 1. Then you get first order accuracy. If you want more accuracy, you use more point. Instead of just using two point, you use current point, which is point 0 next point, which is point 1, and point after next, which is point 2. And you put coefficient minus 1.5 to minus 0.5 over there. So you get the derivative at point 0. So the derivative is at point 0, but is based on the value of point 0, point 1, and point 2. So when I say point 0, point 1, point 2, this means z plus epsilon for point 1, but x and y stay the same. And point 2 means z plus 2 epsilon, x and y stay the same. That's the first derivative. And this, uh, uh, this uh, comes from the Taylor series expansion? Well, yes, this kind of thing comes from Taylor series expansion and some little bit of trick. We don't talk about it, but there's a derivation. Uh, that's the first order. If you want even more accuracy, you use four pi. Right? You use four pi. So first, <coughs> four pi means you need a current pi and another three pi to approximate partial derivative at pi zero. Okay. If you want even more accurate, you use uh, five pi. This one is five pi, and there's formula for more pi. I don't put here. Okay, what about second order derivative? For second order derivative, you can use first order derivative twice. For example, if you use this formula, you get that. Okay, but you don't need to. You can jump and use this table directly. So if you want to do d square f by dz square. That's second order derivative, right? And you just want first order accuracy. Do this. 1 minus 2, 1. So 1 multiplied by current point, I mean y value, f value, minus 2, the middle point, and the next point, and then plus 1. That's finite difference formula. Backward finite difference. <coughs> so there's another table. Okay. You can get table for backward finite difference from forward finite difference easily by 
from finite difference table give all all derivative coefficient with the opposite sign to get backward scheme. So all derivative coefficient, which means first order, right? So even derivative, look at this one and the previous one. What's the difference? The form become bigger and smaller, just that. But they're the same. Okay? You see minus one, minus one, minus two, one, they're the same. The form just get bigger and smaller. The change is okay, another change is when you do forward difference, you do 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. But when you do backward, it is 0, minus 1, minus 2, minus 3, minus 1, and minus 5. So for, for, for odd, odd, uh, odd derivative, instead of 1, you get minus 1, see? Instead of minus 1, you get 1. Instead of minus 3 third, uh, 1 by 5, you get plus 1 by 5. Just change the sign for all derivative. For even derivative, it stays the same. And you just change the point from 0, 1, 2, 3 to be 0, minus 1, minus 2, minus 3. So this means, um, oh, okay. One thing to remember, if you do second order derivative, you have to divide it by epsilon square. Okay, obvious enough, right? So if you do 1, multiplied by uh, f x y z minus 2 multiplied by f x y z plus epsilon plus 1 multiplied by f x y z plus 2 epsilon it has to be divided by uh, epsilon square easy enough central scheme central scheme you see even the first Derivative. You don't have two pi. If you have two pi, you don't have central scheme. You start with three pi. By using three pi, you get second order accuracy, and you do pi minus one, pi zero, and pi plus one. Okay. You multiply minus pi five, multiply zero at the middle, and multiply pi five at the next pi. So this means if you want to get the derivative at x equal to zero, you need the value of y at x equal to previous point, maybe minus point one and plus point one. If you do that, that is central scheme. No problem, no example, okay? I assume that you already know this is a review. Question? No question? Do you want me to ask you a question? Oh, you have so for the backward scheme, how do you identify the points with the negative in the indices, right? Minus backward? Two. You have minus, minus. Oh, okay. Let me draw some picture. There's nothing negative or positive or something. Oh, not thick enough. So let's say I have a graph. And I have point. Okay, that's a part that I have. And you want to do backward scheme. Let's say you want to do backward scheme with two pi. So backward scheme with two pi, you require pi zero and pi minus one. Right? So let's keep the height. The height of this one, let's say, okay, 3.5 The height of this point is 3.0 So backwards scheme means if you want to find the derivative at this location Oh by the way, this is a plot of f as a function of z where x equal to zero and y equal to zero. So this is the change of z. So if you do backward difference, you open the formula, point zero will be the point that you want the slope. So this will be point zero. This will be point minus one. This will be point one. This will be point two. 
So you will do uh, 1 multiplied by 0 0.0, which is 3.5, right? And you will do minus 1 multiplied by the height at point minus 1, so you will be minus 3.0, divided by the gap epsilon, which is 0.5. Whatever that is, that is the slope at this point. At that location, the slope at that location. Okay. Good. Mm. So if you want to use central difference, let's say I want to use five point scheme. Yeah, five point. Oh, I have this four point, so I use that. Forward, uh, forward scheme with four point. Second derivative. 4 pi. How do I do any of that? So if I want to find the second derivative and I use forward scheme, I want to find the uh, derivative at this point only. I mean at uh, z equal to 1. At only at z equal to 1. I want to find d square f by dz square at z equal to 1. So I have to find the height of each point, okay? And the height of point one, uh, height of, so this will be zero, one, two, three. Height of point zero, we will multiply by two. Height of point one, which is 3.5, we will multiply by minus five. Height of point two, we will multiply by two. Height of point three, multiply by minus one. Add them together, divided by epsilon square. That's it, okay? I think that's clear enough. That's come from Wikipedia. Read more over there. Well, this is basically a TRC expansion derivation, right? We get the coefficient. It's a little bit more than that. That's why I said I didn't cover everything. Okay. It's a little bit more than that, but at the end, you get the, those formula. Okay. That is when we have point value and we want to know partial derivative approximation. Can that be used for total derivative approximation? I mean, pretty question, sorry. We, I showed you the formula for PDE. Yeah. Can that be used for? I showed you the formula for partial derivative. Right? The formula just for this. Mm -hmm. Can I use it for total derivative? Uh, yes. For some case. Yeah. So if you just have a variable, the formula is like that, okay? So if you just, your function is just a function of x and there is no other variable, you can use those formula, backward, scheme, forward scheme, everything to get the slope at that point. So notice that if you use more point, you get more crazy, okay? That's a trick. Mm, that's nice. Okay, type of PDE. We have many, many types. So we have ellipt elliptic, hyperbolic, parabolic, and other type. Okay. For <clears throat> generally, we can write the equation in this formula. Okay. D square u by the x one square. D square u by the x one, x two. Blah 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 blah. For elliptic equation, the condition is b square minus four ac less than zero. We don't have any clue what's that about, but. If I say Poisson equation is elliptic form, Laplace equation is elliptic. Laplace equation is steady state heat transfer. Okay, steady state heat transfer mean okay for Laplace equation, two D Laplace equation. Let's say you have a box, oh. and you have one side to be cold. The rest is hot. Cold means zero, hot means 100. And you make the temperature stay constant. If you wait long enough, what is the temperature, steady state temperature? You may guess, you may draw the, some, some profile. You may say, hey, if you wait long enough, close to this, cold, this is zero, this is 100. Another tree is 100, right? You may say, hey, 
this part it should be cold, but the rest may be hot. So you may be able to draw the contour of constant temperature. That's kind of problem is elliptic. Laplace equation. That's Laplace equation. Poisson equation is similar to Laplace, but you just right hand side is not zero. Like Gauss law for electricity. Okay. Solution is smooth, even if initial condition and boundary condition are rough. So let's take a look at this. If I say initially some part of this is extremely hot, some part of this is like 400 Celsius, but this this side, this side, and that side is 100 and the top is zero. If you wait long enough, there will be heat transfer, some adjustment, that 400 will be gone. Right? If you wait long enough, the transient effect will be gone. You have steady state. At the steady state, temperature is not dependent upon initial condition. Right? Let's say this may be 2D, may be difficult. Let's do 1D. I mean, kind of 1D. A rod. Just one, one dimension. So if you have this side hot, this side cold, and you wait long enough, temperature may be like this, linearly increasing, if you wait long enough. So initial condition doesn't impact it, right? At least for Laplace equation. So elliptic PDE, the solution is smooth, okay? Even if IC or BC is rough, then it's still smooth. One value at the boundary impact or affect all solution point. Okay. The boundary impact every point in the solution domain. Parabolic equation. So it's a B square minus 4AC equal to zero. That doesn't give you any clue. Like when you look at this equation, no. So parabolic is like transient heat conduction in solid. So you have the change in time, and you have the spread of heat. I think this is for, you can have this kind of equation for mass transfer too. Heat diffusion and mass diffusion have similar form. Okay. So <clears throat> alpha is. Uh, thermal what, diffusivity, thermal conductivity divided by density divided by heat specific heat capacity. So that's the form. This Laplace operator, sometimes they write just delta, capital delta. And this is the form in Cartesian in Salinical, it looks like that. Okay? How do you solve this? Daniel? How do you solve this? Without learning everything, anything from me, what is the part that you already know? Tell me. You know something, right? You didn't start with zero. How do we solve this? What did you do in reservoir class? Or oh, you didn't take reservoir class? Do you have similar equation in reservoir? Yeah. How do you do that? Hey, great, we just use Eclipse and we are done. Is that what you say? I think, uh, so this kind of equation is an application of, of finite differences. How do you do it? Did you ever done discretization? Yeah. Yeah, but yeah. None? Mm -hmm. How do you solve this? Okay, we will recall you through the project. So, look at this one. One thing to remember is we have one way communication in time. Okay, the capital T by the small t, that is the indication of one way communication in time. Whatever happened right now, the initial collision of heat impact what will happen next time step. But what happened later on doesn't have impact the past. 
We have just one day communication. But elliptic is kind of 2D communication, right? So left battery and right battery, both battery impact the solution. So this is kind of 2D communication in space. For, for transient, we have one-way communication in time. Hyperbolic form, web equation. So d squared u by dt squared equal to uh, speed to the uh, square. And then this is 1D. If it's 2D, you will have instead of this will be charge for 2D problem instead of d squared u by dx squared what will that be? you don't know? none for 2D problem this is 1D problem you have d squared u by dx squared what about it in 2D? what about 3D? you change d squared u by dx squared to be this, right? Yeah. This blah, blah. So when we say 1D, it's just the first term of Laplace. Yeah. Okay, so it's just the first term of the delta operator. So in 2D, you have two terms. In 3D, you have three terms. So this, del square, if it's 1D, you just have just that. If it's 2D, you have more. If it's 3D, you have more. That's Cartesian. If you have cylindrical, 1D, you have just that. 2D, you have more and more. Something like that. Okay. The disturbance in BC cause wave to travel or propagate at speed C. Not every point feel the disturbance all at once. So when you disturb the system on left side, the right side may not feel it right away. Okay. That is uh, hyperbolic. Elliptic PDE equivalent to so elliptic PDE is steady state heat transfer, right? Elliptic. This is elliptic form. Or Laplace equation. If you have just Laplace equation, every point feel the disturbance in the battery condition all at once because it's kind of steady state. <clears throat> do we have any other type of PDE? Yes, we do. And it's more difficult. We talk just about this. Step in solving PDE. First step, optional, not always you make it into dimensionless form. You don't need to, but if you want your answer to be recycled or reduced several times, you should do this. But for numerical calculation, very frequent, we just cannot. Okay. Uh, is that cannot or we should not? Or we don't need to? I don't know, Let, let's see some greater. So you can non-dimensionalize the PDE, non-dimensionalize it, make it to dimensionless form. Then this creates the domain, use the formula that we talk, those three tables, use finite different formula, do some math, and done. And last step is look at the data. So if you have a 3D body, so you have a plate, coal, coal, oh, okay, hot everywhere, uh, let's use red, hot everywhere, hot on every battery, but initially inside is coal. So initially, everywhere is zero, except at the wall, it's 100 Celsius. So if you wait, 10 seconds, maybe around the edge, get hotter, right? And hotter, and hotter, and ev at the end, everywhere is just red. You see my point? We have to have to make some kind of method to look at the data, visualize the data, okay? Make, make it make sense to you. So last step is to look at the solution at time slice. So you take one snapshot, take a look at it, and you put several snapshots together, make the video. That's what this is about. Where's my video? The video that you have seen earlier. Okay. Believe it or not, with just this table, 
Just this table, three table, and some concept. That's final difference. None. Okay. Step zero. Oh, let's start with the equation. <coughs> Solving one D heat equation. In this example, we solve one dimension transient heat transfer copper in copper. So one D, I have just d square t by d x square. Jer, if it is two D, what term do I have more? Y. Can you read the full one? Uh, that's, uh, d square t by d y square. Yeah. Can we do it in other shape like circle shape? Can we use polar coordinate system? Yeah, if you use polar coordinate system, and it's and you assume that every angle. The solution is the same, so it's like symmetry. So instead of this, you have this term. Okay, nothing difficult. So initial condition at time group zero, everywhere is twenty Celsius. Okay, for all t in the domain omega. We have temperature equal to 20. Omega is domain. I define it from 0 to 0.03. I think the unit is meter because this is 3 centimeter, one dimension copper bar. It's a 3 centimeter. Or Ti, which is initial temperature equal to 20 everywhere. Boundary condition. At x equal to zero, meter, temperature equal to fifty, at any time. Okay, at any time, fifty Celsius. Another boundary condition. You have two boundary. We have need to have two boundary condition. Another boundary condition. At at the end, x equal to three centimeter. Dt by the x equal to zero. That is, no heat loss. Okay, no heat loss. So this means we assume perfect insulation at at another end. So this means we just start cool twenty and we attach the left battery to fifty Celsius and we want to see heat propagate to the right hand side, given that the right side is insulated. Okay. <clears throat> uh, that's a unit, okay? For copper, alpha equal to something, something, something. I think that's number come from engineering two box. Yeah. Non-dimensionalized process. I wanted to make it dimensionless. I define t tilde equal to t minus t initial divided by. T zero minus T initial. T zero is T at x equal to zero. Okay, that's T zero. So this means if I start between twenty and one edge is at fifty, do you expect my temperature to be lower than twenty? Could be more than. This depends on the initial condition. The initial condition is 20. So initially, everywhere is at 20 Celsius. And I attach one side with 50. You can't go lower. So this means we should not have any temperature inside to be lower than 20. 20. Can it be more than 50? No. It should not. So you are supposed to be between 20 and 50. For this kind of thing that we know the maximum and minimum limit, you should, or I should, Limit it to be from 0 and 1. Like scale it to be from 0 and 1. So that my solution can be used for something else. Let's say I have another, another uh, uh, question that initially the temperature is instead of 20 is 21. Or instead of 20 is like 200. I can use the solution that I already have. Just multiply by something and it's done. Okay. 
x tilde defined by x minus a, a is 0, is the left point, divided by b minus a, b is the right point, which is 3 cm minus 0. So this is dimensionless x. Okay. So then we derive the relationship between partial derivative with respect to x and partial derivative with respect to x tilde. Then we can have partial derivative, or then we can have the relationship between d by d, d, d t tilde by dt and d regular capital T by dt. So that's the coefficient that we have. Oh, you can do this, right? Just a little bit of math. So dt tilde by dx tilde, here's the chain rule, is d capital T tilde by dx multiplied by dt multiplied by dx by dx tilde. d cap capital T tilde by dx is uh, what? Mm. has some relationship with this. So you can change t tilde to regular t by take the denominator out. Right? So you can do this. No need to teach. It's already taught in calculus. Can you? Yeah. Okay. It's important. And if you cannot, redo this part. Okay, it's just a shared rule. Alright, what about d squared t by dx squared? What is the relationship between d squared t tilde by dx tilde squared and d squared regular t by this x regular x squared? I get the relationship like this. So you're just trying to find the relationship. Do some math, more math. Substituted everything in, I found this equation. Look at this. d by dx squared, this side is dimensionless. This is dimensionless. t is not dimensionless yet. So if I define something like this, t tilde equal to alpha divided by that by I t, I get that. Why do I have to define t like that? Mathematical convenience. It's just convenience. It's just mathematical convenience, right? Why do I have to define t dimension as temperature like that? It's just mathematical convenience. It's, it's convenience that you have something go from 0 and 1, and x go from 0 and 1. Right? It's just for convenience purpose. So once I do that for the equation, I have to do the same thing for the boundary condition. So at x equal to 0, x tilde also equal to 0. T, capital T equal to t0, this means t tilde equal to 1. So if you substitute t to be t0, then t tilde equal to 1. Right? Do the same thing. dt by dx, the equivalent dimension as form is dt tilde by dx tilde. But if this is 0, dt tilde by dx 0 is 0 too. Okay, now let's do... So now, instead of working with dimensional form, we can work with dimensionless form. And everyone knows how to do this. Do you need to test you on it? No, you will do it in your project. In your project, you will really need to review this and do this one. Okay. Oh, maybe you don't need to, maybe you have to do the full form, maybe that's easier. Now we do discretization. I use forward scheme in time. Forward scheme means I approximate the slope by using the current part and the next part. Okay. Notice that my left hand side is d by dt, right? And right hand side is d squared t by dx squared. Everything on the right hand side is defined at n. Okay? And only this part is n plus 1. So if everything on the right hand side defined at n, and you have 
you approximate dt by d small t by tn plus 1 minus tn. This means this one is a forward scheme. Forward scheme means we use the current point, the current slope to get the next point. Right? If you have backward scheme, this part you can write the same. Okay. But everything on the right hand side must be defined at n plus 1. Temperature at n plus 1 or the next time step is not available. We use something in the future to relate to something in the future too. That's backward scheme. But for forward scheme, we use the current slope or current point to approximate the next point. So, depending on how your central scheme, I know that this is central scheme, right? You get from the table. This is central scheme. If your central scheme defined at n, that is forward. If it is defined at n plus 1 and the rest is the same, that is backward scheme. Okay? So it's like backward Euler and forward Euler, if you recall. Question. So if we do uh, if we do backward, 